Hi everyone, I'm Kelly with iBelieve.com. I'm so excited to um, talk to Lydia Brownback today about her new book. It's called Finding God in My Loneliness. And I think, Lydia, that we can both say that this is a topic that everyone struggles with and it's relevant. And um, it's something that we were just talking about before we got on air that um, hasn't really been written about a lot, but I think that it's something that we all, we all feel. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you today about it. Thank you for writing this book for us. Thanks for having me on today, Kelly. It is, it's is—it's a—it's a hot button issue. I think it's being discussed a little bit more than in, in times past, um, given some of the changes in our culture that's, that have bred more loneliness and people are trying to understand why. And I think one of the biggest challenges is even identifying sometimes that that's what we're feeling. You know, it, 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 hunting around inside, we know something's missing, something's off, but to identify it as loneliness can be harder to do. So Lydia, let's just talk about the kind of the more theological question of, okay, we're all struggling with this and why? Why is this something that it seems like everyone universally struggles with? Well, you know, it's actually kind of hope producing the answer to that question. And if you think about the fact that God when he created us, when he created Adam and put him in the garden, he said it was not good that man should be alone. That was before the fall, before sin even entered the world. There was a loneliness. There was a aloneness that needed to be remedied. So we can't just blame it on sin. We have to say that God actually created us with a capacity for loneliness. And he did that so that we would yearn for companionship, that we would actually get outside of ourselves and go look for it. And ultimately to find it in him uh, also with other people, because it, otherwise we'd be so prone in our selfishness to curve inward, to avoid having to tangle up with people and all the difficulties that go with it, to have to submit our lives to others, especially to the Lord. So, so to be able to have that capacity, that sort of hole in our hearts, it was part of God's design for putting us on this earth. So he created us with that. It's, it's sin that actually makes it an unpleasant thing to experience. You know, it, it, it's, it's what makes us answer it in wrong ways to go after wrong solutions. Uh, but, but just the capacity for loneliness by itself was part of the goodness of how God created us. Yeah, definitely. I think that Whenever we feel emotion like that, like loneliness, we tend to think, oh, I shouldn't, I couldn't possibly need to be experiencing this or God couldn't possibly want me to experience this. I must try to like make it go away. And I think that that's really spot on of just reframing that in our minds and seeing, okay, what good is God doing in that? And what does he want me to learn about him and about myself and about creation? So let's talk about today's uh, Christian woman. I think that in the age that we're in, in the age of Instagram and Facebook, where we kind of um, put ourselves out there, maybe it's a version of ourselves out there. Um, we we seem to be more um, included and and brought together than ever before, but we all kind of feel more lonely, I think, than ever before too. Um, what are your thoughts on that? What has social media done to kind of perpetuate the feeling of loneliness? Well, you know, people talk about how it isolates us more from others, but I think it goes even deeper than that. I, you know, I, I, I think we, we hear a lot about fake news today. That's all the buzz, fake news, fake news. Well, if you think about it, Facebook, Instagram, uh, it's fake news, you know, especially Facebook. When you think about how you, uh, this really hit home to me a few years ago when everyone in my life was, was away for, for a spring vacation. They were all at the beach with their families. And every day you see these pictures posted online of the happy, the scenes on the beach and family time. And, and there I was stuck in the snow, not uh, on vacation by myself. And it suddenly made my life look really bleak. And I felt very alone. And it, it dawned on me though, then that, that nobody is their Facebook page. You know, it's, it's everyone puts forward the image they want to project, the identity they want to have. And Facebook allows us an opportunity to be whoever we want to be. And it's, it's like the, you think about the Christmas letters we send out every year. 
uh, and I love, I'm sure you love reading them. I love reading them, Callie. And, and, but you think about the things that are put in there. It's people recap the family year. You know, they talk about the successes of their children and the milestones and the vacations and other things. No one writes in that Christmas letter about their marriage problems or about their kids failure in school. You know, you put your best face forward because that's how we want to be perceived. So as we're looking at everyone else's Facebook or, or social media, we're seeing what they want us to see and we take it in as the reality. And then it makes us knowing our own lives feel like something's missing. When in reality, nobody is, the, is what their Facebook page looks like. So, so that has intensified our loneliness as we look out there and see what everyone else presents and makes us say, what's wrong with my life if I'm not at the beach having a good time? We don't know that that family hasn't just had a huge fight before they stood up for that picture they posted, you know? And so it's, it's created an unreality about other people's lives that makes us evaluate our own lives negatively. And what do you think that we should be doing kind of as believers in that regard? I mean, is the answer to just be more um, mindful about what we're posting? Like if we've had a major fight at the beach, you know, right before we take that picture, is that should we be more mindful of, oh, am I just sharing this because I want everyone to think that, you know, my life's a certain way? Because I think the opposite could be where we tend to just um, share all the mess too. And that might not necessarily be the right thing either. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think you're right. That's not the right thing. And it's maybe not even so much changing what we're doing as how we're viewing what other people are doing. You know, it, it, Facebook and, and social media, Instagram, those things, they're kind of like the photograph albums of the previous generation. You know, it, same thing, all the photos, the happy scenes captured. And we all want to look back on that. That's why we create photo albums or Facebook photo albums. It's it, it, so that we can have and remember the good times in the memory. So, so I don't ne- think it's necessarily changing that. It's just when we view other people's, what do we take in? Let's, let's just not get this idea in mind that it's all real because there's a lot of other stuff. Even if that was the happy moment, it was totally real. Think about the rest of their lives that we're not seeing and remember the reality that, that we're all in this together. We all have our happy moments and we all have our difficulties. We record for posterity, the happy ones, but just, we need to be aware that there are many more that aren't happy that aren't posted. So I think it's just staying connected uh, but but doing so with a with a real dose of reality in our mind. Um, I want to talk a minute about one line that you had in the book because it just really jumped out at me about self seeking versus self forgetfulness. Um, you and I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. But it says you 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 talk about how self seeking breeds loneliness and self forgetfulness breeds fullness. Um, and I would just love to talk more about that. I think that. The Christian subculture, I just see this so much in the pitches that I get um, from different writers or in the books that I get across my table. Um, We're all kind of getting more and more obsessed with like, what's my personality? What's my Enneagram number? What, how do, am I an introvert? Am I an extrovert? How does that play out in how I build my platform and how I brand myself and how I present myself to others? And um, it just feels, it's starting to feel, I'm getting a little, ooh, every time I, I get that across my desk and across my computer, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about it. Um, is that a form of self-seeking that we're kind of having? And how do we become, I guess, more self-forgetful? You know, it's a huge issue right now, and it's a pet peeve of mine. In fact, I'm writing a book on that very thing are right you? now. Good. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just so all the branding and the, you know, and it's one thing when you think about that out in the world. But when you think about it amongst believers, it doesn't it kind of make you think about when Jesus went in the temple and flipped the tables over? I mean, are we are we capitalizing or building our own identity out of the gospel, out of his word, out of him? And and how how abhorrent is that? You know, it's just and I think people do it without even realize they're doing it. And, uh, you know, we we don't start out that way, but it's what it can turn into so easily. So so you think about what Jesus said here. Um, he talked about, um, he said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So what did he say there? Right there, we see the seeds of self-forgetfulness in what he's talking about. He talks about dying to self, dying. And then he said, unless you do that, it uses the seed there. It remains alone. 
So there is a link between self-focus and loneliness. And if we really look into what he's talking about, and, and he he's it's self-death, self-forgetfulness self is where life is found according to Jesus. And it's what he meant by taking up our cross and, and following him. And all too often, though, we look inward for answers to life, to answers to solving our loneliness or our aloneness or to making life work somehow, to carving out that identity we want. Um, we look inward, but the direction of scripture is always upward and outward. You know, it's 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 upward to God and outward toward others. And, and that's how we experience the abundant life that the gospel holds out to us. And it seems counterintuitive, Kelly, doesn't it? But I think about how in terms of the category of loneliness here, for single people, for even for some married people, for, for people, a lot of people, I just a couple months ago when the book first came out, you think about Valentine's Day. There are so many people who dread that that little holiday. And and so what do they do? They they want to hide. Um, and so I remember years ago as a single person, uh, I, turning that day into something that wasn't about me and what I don't have, it was about thinking of that there's always somebody lonelier. There's always somebody more alone. And there's always people to love. So, you know, I love the whole idea of the hearts and the flowers and the pink and the red and the white. So so I got into making fun candies and cookies and sending them to people, going to visit a shut-in in a nursing home. Or uh, so many people we know is someone in my church who is alone, even more lonely. And I now love that day because it's an opportunity to get into the pink and the red and the white and the hearts and the flowers and to shower that on other people. So see, that's that's getting outward and upward. And it's amazing how what was a dreaded event now is something I love. So So we think Mother's Day is coming up. Well, how many, how, what a difficult Sunday at church that is for so many mothers who cannot, or would be mothers, women who have lost a child or, or who would love to be mothers who aren't. And sometimes they skip church because of all the fuss made about it. Well, the better thing is, is find a way to be upward and outward and go love people who are sadder than you, who are maybe hurting more, and then you will stop dreading the day. And, and I think that's how we, we turn around something that can be difficult um, and, and get over ourselves and get out of ourselves, not in a wag our finger in the face kind of like, oh, get over yourself, but in a more saying Jesus invitation to us is to be self forgetful, to die to self. It's, it's not a crushing. It's an, it's an opportunity to find happiness actually. Oh, I love it. I can't wait for your book on it. I will, yeah, I'll gobble it up. I do feel like there's so much freedom and I'm very introspective and an introvert so it's very easy for me to just get caught up in my own thoughts constantly just ruminating on things and in, in my own self and how am I coming off across people and it's exhausting and it's it's in those days where I can focus outward and actually forget about my own self that I do find so much more freedom and joy and a zest for life and um, I think yeah like you said it's putting it's it's looking outward putting God and others over ourselves it's really crucial. The counterintuitive thing is we find the very thing that we think we won't find. It, it, it's, it's as we forget ourselves, we find a fulfillment that isn't possible any other way. We will never find it by looking inward and by constantly trying to answer the question, what do people think of me? And shaping our lives to direct the answer to that question. I mean, that's forget ourselves altogether. You know, let's think about Jesus. Mm. All right, well, let's switch gears for uh, just a second and talk about, in the book, you talk about some of the lies that loneliness tells us, and I'd love for you to talk about a little bit of that and um, the truth that we need to, to be telling ourselves to combat those lies. Okay, well, yeah, one lie is that we, we've kind of addressed it already, and that's that we think that loneliness or being alone is purely evil and something must be terribly wrong. Well, as we said, God created us with the capacity to feel loneliness, so we can't say it's purely evil. It's, it's when sin enters in and, and, and provokes it, what causes that and all the things surrounding it are, are what make it bad. Uh, and so, so the solution is to say, all right, well, if God created me with this capacity to feel lonely, it can't be purely evil. It's what I do with it. So it's, it's saying, okay, I'm alone in this season of life. I'm feeling very lonely. Let's first sit down with the Lord and, and not, not fear it, not dread it, but go to him with it. 
And it, it doesn't mean that something's wrong with us. And it's, 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 that's another lie. It's believing that I'm lonely because something's wrong with me. And instead saying, no, God created me to feel this way. Why? So I would get out of myself, have fellowship with others, and primarily with Christ. So it's, it's, it's debunking the lie that something's wrong with you. I think that's the first thing. Another lie is we say, I shouldn't have to be alone. We look around and other people aren't alone. We feel alone, so I shouldn't have to be alone. And that's where when we start giving a home to that lie, we're going to refuse God's way. We're going to say, I don't like that. I don't want that. And we're going to try to take matters into our own hands. And then we'll, we'll want to escape loneliness any way we can. And if we develop the sort of escapist mentality, then we're going to be prone to uh, just killing time instead of filling time. We're going to want to escape the bad feelings. And, and women can do that in all kinds of ways, whether it's through addictions uh, whether it's social media or alcohol or food or, or sleep or spending, uh, whatever it might be, sometimes it's, it's the, what drives these things is a desire to escape the loneliness we can't fix. And, uh, and, and the lie feeding that is I shouldn't have to go through this. So since God hasn't given me what I think I need, I will take matters into my own hands. It never works. Um, uh, you know, I think that ties right into the other lie is that I can fix my loneliness myself. Mm-hmm. And we think, well, I better fix it. God doesn't seem to be doing it. So I better do something. And when we allow that thinking to, to take hold of us, we're going to grab onto what's available. And often we're going to make really bad decisions. Quick panic. Decision. Anything we do out of panic never results in good. Lydia, my last question for you is um, you have a chapter in here about um, the church, and I think that we can deceive ourselves, lie to ourselves, and say I'm the only like lonely person here in this congregation, in my church, in my neighborhood. Um, what can we – is there a role or responsibility that we have to other believers, to people in our communities, our church communities, the greater community, um, to be addressing loneliness? Yeah, I think there's some practical things we can do as well as some ways to think. Um, I, you know, I think, first of all, we go in there and we don't, we don't just stick to our demographic group. You know, we don't, we don't, you know, if we're a married couple, we don't just stay, my whole world here is going to be the married couple Sunday school class. And if we're single, we don't just stick with the singles group. We, you know, we, we tend to divide in our church by demographic and then we, we become our own little subculture and, and that doesn't, then it isolates us from what God intended the church to be, which is a a unified whole as a family, a a whole family. And, and, and each, each of us going in there has by the Lord's design, unique gifts to contribute. They're meant to be lived out in the body of the church. So we can, we, we, if we need help identifying what they are, whatever it takes, we need to find out what our gifts are, and, and put them to use. The Apostle Paul said, he who has gifts, let him use them. It's a command to, to be useful to the body of Christ. And if you're a believer, you have been given spirit-given gifts. So, so put them to use. And, and then also encourage others to put them to use. At, uh, this is a practical thing we can do. And, and, you know, just because this is another thing that's helpful, just because there's a need in the church doesn't mean that we're the right one to have to fill it. The need isn't always the call. And so, so if you don't feel good at something or, or inclined toward it at all, but, but it's there to do, doesn't mean that you're being called to go fill that thing up. And I think that can be discouraging to people. Uh, just because there's a need and I happen to be available, well, you know, that's not necessarily the case. So it's, it's, there's a wisdom that comes into play. It's wanting to be helpful, but, but not feeling the compulsion to have to do something you're not gifted to do, but definitely using your gifts. And, you know, I think another thing is um, it, it's where we find comfort in suffering in the body of Christ. And we're meant to, you know, we're told in Corinthians here, I have what Paul wrote. He said um, that by God's design, you know, we, we belong to each other. So we're meant to share our lives, the good times and the bad, the failures and the successes. And God promises to comfort us in all our sufferings. And the primary way he does this is through the family of believers that we belong to. And this is what Paul wrote. He said that God comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to turn around and comfort others in the same way. So that's a huge part of of how the church meets us in our loneliness and our loneliness. And it's God designed for that purpose. 
So, so the Lord wants to comfort us and then use us to comfort others. And we're meant to live that out in the body of Christ. And I'd say finally, as far as the church goes, this is where it can be really helpful and an important thing about today's church. And that is that we make Christ the focus, not politics, not family growth, not marriage enrichment, not cultural engagement. You know, what matters most in church is not what we do for Christ. It's what matters most is Christ himself. And so if we just would fix our eyes again, outward, upward on Jesus, then we're going to find the remedy that we crave inside and can't quite put our finger on. Thank you. Well, I'm looking so forward to sharing more of this with our audience. We're going to obviously share this interview um, on just the websites. We'll do it on I Believe mainly, but then Crosswalk too. And and then we're hoping to do have some portion and segment of this in our podcast that we're starting for Crosswalk. So we'll probably try to play the audio in that a little bit. So Wonderful. hopefully we'll get the message out about your book because um, it's so great. And I think it's going to be an encouragement to many people. Thank so, you so much, Kelly. I appreciate this. You. It's really been fun. Oh, thank you. Well, have a good blessed day. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.